Mandel of Lee Mandel Consulting. He describes himself as a renowned serial entrepreneur, unless you're a PR person did that yeah, for you. you never okay. know. <laughs> Technologist, inventor, uh, investor, and founder, former founder and CEO of Intralogic Solutions, one of the nation's leading security tech companies. Read these bio notes on this guy. They're like a who's who of what, right? So let's take a look at that. I'm not going to spend this time going over them again. They're right there in print in front of you. But what's so special about this is that rare is the occasion that you have the opportunity to get into the mind of a yacht owner in a public forum such as this. Most owners will shun, shun the spotlight. They don't want any part of that. They don't want to be known. But Lee, by his, through his own ownership and the way his approach to yachting, welcomes this kind of an opportunity to share what he knows and what's why he's been ha Well, I was gonna say why you're happy. I haven't determined yet whether you're a happy yacht, yacht owner. To be determined, right? Yeah. <laughs> So, are you a happy yacht owner? Yeah, I would say for the most part I am. It's been an interesting journey. So, uh, definitely at this point, uh, since 2019, it's, it's been an enjoyable experience for the most part. A lot of bumps along the road, but definitely an enjoyable experience overall. So, you said there have been a few rough spots, such as, well, tell us about the journey. Well, by, I had a security company focused uh, in New York and Florida. We sold school security technology. Um, after the horrific events of Parkland, as you can imagine, the security industry went completely chaotic. Um, expanded our business, gave me the opportunity to sell the company in 2019. And upon the sale of the company, my financial advisor said, you got to make a decision. You either buy a, a yacht, a plane, or a farm. I said, well, not much of a farmer. My <laughs> wife will probably murder me if I get a plane. So I'm definitely a boater. So we said, uh, let's start on the journey to looking for a yacht. And that's when it all began. So do you have the plane and the farm now in addition to the yacht? I don't know. Just, just, the, just the yacht right now is enough to handle. So at the beginning, when you and I first met, um, it was somewhere in a warehouse district right around here. I forget where it was, right around here. Yep. And um, we had Mike, Sc Mike Scalisi was, was your broker, okay? Everybody know Mike from HMY, real sharp guy. He's on our board of directors. Um, why Mike Scalisi? Was he just... I, drawn out of a hat, or did you look for him, or what was it? That's a great, great question, and probably good for the people in this room to kind of understand. Uh, I didn't know Mike Pryor. You know, I had a boating background, grew up on boats my whole life, uh, a 19-foot, a 24-foot, a 34-foot. You know, back in 2015, I was the crazy one who decided, now that my family doesn't have a boat anymore, to buy a boat of my own. We ended up buying a 52-foot Sea Ray. So I had that boating experience prior to 2019. Uh, had my captain's license, ran that boat back from New York to Florida. So when it came time to buy a yacht, I didn't know where to turn. Obviously, much different than what we had purchased with the 52-foot Sea Ray. And I wanted someone I could trust. So I, I reached out to a friend of mine, another a business owner, and I said, down in Florida, what's the go-to company? Who do I call? Where do I go? And he said, well, you should reach out to HMY. So I remember specifically, I was on my 52-foot boat in Aventura, and I Googled HMY, dialed the phone number at 7.30 in the morning, hit the button for sales, and Mike Scalisi picked up the phone. And um, you know, right away, I didn't know Mike, I didn't have any experience with Mike, but he made me feel comfortable. And I remember the first thing I said to Mike when he said, are there any boats or any yachts that you're not looking to look into? Any brands, any specific types? And I said, I want to stay away from an azimuth. And he goes, why do you want to stay away from azimuth? Well, I've heard some challenges with them. And, you know, these are the brands I'm looking at, the brands I'm not looking at. He said, no problem. Uh, within a week, Mike had sent me a whole bunch of listings. He was not very aggressive. And I told him I was just in the transition of selling my company, super busy. While this is a priority, it's not my number one priority. I said, I don't want calls every day. I don't want emails every five minutes. I said, I'd love to work with you if you can work with my style of purchasing. Um, I think we'll have a great relationship. And from that point forward, Mike, Mike was just great. He wasn't aggressive. Um, he sent me what I wanted. Um, and I became friends with Mike. And to this day, both Mike, his wife, and my wife are very close friends. We travel together, go on vacations together. And this all stemmed from buying a boat. And um, the amount of referrals that Mike's gotten from me since then because of that is just incredible. Yeah. The chance to be able to listen to what it was that was good about Mike Scalisi and H&Y and all these good things is a chance for all of you to consider the dynamics of the purchase process and ownership and all those kind of things, too. And, uh, you know, somehow I got introduced to the equation. What was that all about? Why was I there? Why would you need me? 
So I think when we went to go purchase the yacht, and again, just to elaborate a little bit more, you know, I'm a salesperson by trade. I sold my whole life in my prior career. So it's always the most difficult sale to sell a salesperson um, because they read through all the sales approaches and tactics. And, and Mike just did a great job of that. And when I was speaking to Mike, I said, look, Mike, this is a whole different animal, and it's very rare you have a salesperson who tries to almost talk you out of the purchase and tell you all the things to be wary of. And, and that's what actually excited me to make the purchase even more, um, to the fact that I can trust him. He made me comfortable. Um, and when we started looking at yachts, you know, I had a bunch of questions. And even yachts that Mike had the listing on, we went through, we walked through the vessels, and I asked questions, and he goes, this one's not for you for this reason, that reason. He didn't try to push me in one direction or another. And as we started talking further, you know, we started getting into the questions of, do we want to charter this vessel? Um, is this going to be a private use vessel? I said, no, this is solely a business. Um, you know, I know this is not going to necessarily be an immediate money-making business, but I want to transform the yachting industry. And he said, well, I got to introduce you to a good friend of mine, a colleague, a mentor, and that's Bob. And when I met Bob, you know, it again gave me that level of comfort that I was able to ask you the questions, um, get honest answers. Um, you weren't trying to sell me a vessel. You weren't trying to sell me a, a charter service. You, well, I you told me you how it is. I, I definitely talked you out of a couple, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You told me the truth. You told me how it is, what to be wary of, what to look for. And I just felt like we were building a team when we were working with HMY, um, from Mike to Bob to our charter broker uh, to this day, Susan Harris. You know, I felt like we were putting a solid team together, a, a group of people that I can be around and trust. Well, so your attitude was into going into chartering. And let me, I also want to mention to you, you're all going to retch when I say it again. I, I continue to mention this, this uh, statistic that I, when I was with Camper Nicholson's, we developed a super yachting index, did a lot of research in the marketplace and all that, and discovered that 78% of those that buy or build a yacht have chartered at least once. So if charter's not part of your corporate profile or your business model and all, you're really missing it. Because once they get in and they're thinking about it and they're not sure, you can say, hey, charter once and see how you like it. And they charter and they love it. And then they charter again and they say to each other, why don't we have our own boat? And there you are. 78%, three quarters or better than three quarters, buy or build after chartering at least once. So get them into that. But you've been, would you say you've been, had it been a charter success? Yeah, I mean, I, I personally had never been on a charter um, prior to purchasing the vessel, but I have to say, you know, when we purchased the vessel, it had about six or seven charters per year, um, you know, based off the history and the financials that we reviewed. And, you know, the average that we were hoping to get was eight to ten. And, you know, I said, just like I transformed the security industry, I want to transform the yachting industry. And if you Google my name, there's a couple of great articles that we've written about how we've done that. And we have truly have transformed the charter yacht industry. Um, I mean, this past year we had 25 successful term charters, um, which is absolutely unheard of. Um, we've had a successful amount of repeat guests coming back and forth. And we can talk more about charters and you know wh what I attribute that success to. But my intent going into this, unlike several you know owners, and I think they need to be handled differently by their broker. If you're looking to sell to a, an owner who wants to charter the vessel, it's a different type of sale than some is looking to use this for their family privately. Um, we have our own private vessel. This is strictly a business for us. Um, and it was a much different sale, and Mike knew that, Bob knew that from day one. Are you deprived of using your yacht because you're chartering too much? Uh, there's really not enough time. I mean, the way I always say, look, if we have an open week and uh, the crew doesn't need a break, which they always need a break, but if the crew doesn't need a break, I'll be happy to use it. But um, I enjoy the 52-foot. You know, I'm not fancy. I don't need the whole crew, but don't get me wrong. It's a great experience as well. So yours is a little bit different because yours is strictly a business approach then. All right. Now, but had you intended it to be that way or was it because you were so wildly successful that it just turned out that way? And so you stay on your 52 and you let the 116... Go like crazy. Well, the original thought was to always make it a business. Yep. Um, I didn't realize how successful it was going to turn into and the, the, the level that it was going to turn into. We're actually actively you know, looking at potentially expanding the fleet, if you will, to another vessel yep. because of the success. But going into this, we did go into this as the hopes to be a, a successful business. Um, it was never intended as a private vessel, so to speak. So the... Um you can refuse not to, you can plead the fifth on this if you want. But uh, so the tax dynamics, and I have been working with owners for many, 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 many years who have put their boats into charter. Uh, I don't, I've never been in tax court one time to try to prove the case whether they are legitimate or not, but there's like a famous checklist. So do you, do, I don't mean take advantage, but do you enjoy 
the running it as a business and taking advantage of whatever taxes, uh, breaks or whatever is available to you. Yeah, so when I went to do this, I consulted tons of advisors. Um, one of the advisors I found was a, um, a company called Yacht CFO uh, that I found online. And, uh, you know, I consulted a gentleman named Bill Lair who runs that company. And I said, look, you know, you successfully have deployed yachts as a business for many years. I want to do this by the book. What do I have to do to make this 100% legitimate business operation? And, you know, between him, Mike, and Bob kind of guided me through the process. Um, and there's great advantages, uh, tax advantages, especially in the position I was uh, in selling my business. But the key is to do it 100% by the book and to have those, you know, trusted advisors that can guide you to doing that. Yeah, you can't use your yacht 51 weeks a year and charter it one week a year and take advantage of the tax losses. I can take advantage of that. You said you reformed the yacht, the charter business. What, what do you mean by that? How did you reform the charter business? Well, the typical... Uh, uh, from the traditional model as to what, you know. Yeah, I mean, the typical charter business, like I said, you, you see people doing eight to ten charters a year. Um, they're using it for private purposes and business purposes, and they're just trying to offset costs. Um, you know, I went into this just like I went into any business that I've started up, and I said, is there a physical way that I can break even and then make money and gain the tax benefits of, of having this vessel as well? And that was the intent in going into this, is figuring out how we can do this, how we can scale it um, from a marketing standpoint, from an efficiency standpoint, um, from a PR standpoint. What's the best way to attract guests to this experience? And again, not having been a charter a user for many, for ever, ever, you know, it was definitely difficult to kind of learn on the fly and figure out, you know, how do I make this experience as good as it possibly can be? Yeah. So um, here we got a guy who has a big yacht. Are there any plans for anything in the future to go even larger than that? Or are you going to stay with what you, the proven model? And the yeah, no, I think a big decision in the size, you know, it's a 116 Azimut. The uh, name of the vessel is Taillights. Um, and the big thing for me was figuring out what's that sweet spot. And, you know, we obviously know without going commercial, the restriction we have is 12 guests. So how can we can take advantage of that 12 guest layout um, in the smallest form factor possible so that we can attract the largest audience as far as the charter price? And that's where this yacht fit perfectly with the layout, where we can comfortably fit 12 guests on it. Ideally, we'd love to have 10 guests on it, but we're at that mark. So I don't anticipate going bigger anytime soon. I think before I go bigger, I'd probably go with a second yacht just because the worst thing is when you have opportunities and people looking to charter the vessel and you don't have weeks available. Yeah. So I think that would be my first step, but yeah. definitely enjoy the process. Anybody care to harbor a guest? From my management experience, I've represented a couple thousand yacht owners over the years. How many weeks of owner's use, private owner's use, is, is the average on a private yacht? It's five to six weeks a year. And so a lot of owners will say, gosh, you know, the decision to buy it, it, they're, they're saying, gosh, we, you know, I'm still working, you're still working, we can't really use it. Why do we want to have a yacht? That's where the broker should be saying, you thought to think about chartering. Well, what's chartering all about? You know, you got to talk to Bob Saxon, okay, <laughs> first. But then uh, you get him, into, get him going in that direction. Or if they say, for example, ah, oh, this is way too expensive, we really can't afford this. We only use it a limited amount of time, it, it makes absolutely no sense. And you say, why don't you think about chartering the yacht? Chartering, how does that work? Well, you got to talk to Bob Saxon. So that's how that all works, and it's, it's a dynamic. I hate to keep going back to it, but that's the business model that we're dealing with here, okay? This isn't private. This is a business. And so um, uh, build that into your sales equations as you're talking to those owners out there where you reach those points where you're, you can't close them, and there's objections to, to the closing, and they, you may discover that it's one of the two. Can't use it enough? or it costs too much. And the solution is to put it into a business, a bona fide business. Bob Weiss, anybody remember Bob Weiss by chance? Jeff might, uh, Laura, uh, he owned seven yachts. He started at Broward with a 76, then a 90, then a 100, then a 120. His, I think his, in fact, his final yacht was a 120 Broward called Destiny. And he had a captain named Freddie uh, Appleton. The only one that I can compare to is, is you because they did eight straight years, 120 feet, five staterooms at 22 weeks a year. Okay. And Bob Weiss, and I want you to reflect on this. Bob Weiss once said to me, Bob, because I was charter managing the yacht, he said, if I'm, if I'm on my yacht and I'm having dinner and you tell me that there's a charter client standing on the dock, I'm going to get up, wash the dishes, help them with their luggage, and I'll find a hotel someplace. Been there, done that. <laughs> <laughs> how how, how um, important is your charter manager? 
huge. I mean, the relationship, uh, it's a team, like I said, yeah. um, between yourself that we've worked with, between yeah. Susan Harris, a charter manager, yeah. Mike Scalisi to this day um, is actively involved yeah. in the business with us. You know, our attorney that we work with, as well as our yacht CFO, it's a team. It's building uh, an executive organization with these people being your C-suite you know, team. And it's super, super important, the relationship. When I met Susan, um, and this was part of the pitch that Mike made to me, is, you know, you're not just buying a yacht from me, you're getting the team. Um, and that was huge for me, and especially me, because I wanted to charter a vessel. And I said to Susan, look, if it's not broke, I'm not going to fix it. You know, you've been successful on this yacht before. Um, here's the expectation. I want to do 20 plus charters a year. If you can achieve that for me, you're my gal. If you can't, we got to look for alternate opportunities. And so far to this day, Susan's met and exceeded those expectations. Susan's one of the, I hired Susan at HMI. She's fantastic. So what, um, what's the most difficult yachting decision you've ever had to make? Have there been any really difficult ones, like captain termination or anything like this? Yeah, a couple. I can uh, relate one to crew and one to guests. Going backwards first with the guests, you know, I I'm very hands-on and very unique. Um, this week we have the yacht coming into LMC for a major refit, 60-plus uh, vendors. I'm probably one of the few owners that gives the entire crew off for two months and manage the shipyard myself. Mm -hmm. um, very unique. But with that being said, you know, the captain relies on me to help him make decisions from land. Um, I have an executive assistant that works directly with the captain to oversee everything. We had one charter that was on a New Year's uh, where there was drugs involved, and we had to make a very important decision uh, reputationally uh, for the vessel, for the crew, for the safety, on how to effectively terminate the charter safely. And everyone was up, including the attorneys, at midnight, right after the, uh, the ball dropped in New York City to figure out how we get these guests off the boat. Um, and it was a challenge. We got the whole team together quickly and effectively and we're able to work through that process. And I would say the second biggest challenge is crewing. Um, crew is not easy, and Bob's been instrumental in helping me with that. Um, finding a captain that's not just the right fit for the program, but the right fit for you. Um, you know, since 2019, I, I currently have my third captain. Uh, he's been with me for almost three years now. Um, absolutely incredible, and it's, it's a matter of finding, you know, you're finding a master of ceremonies, an MC, so to speak. Driving the vessel is the easy part of being a captain. It's uh, the guests, the satisfaction, the customer service, the interaction with the owner. Um, that was super important to me, and, you know, the first captain was great to get us started, taught, taught me what I needed to learn about yachting. The second captain didn't quite work out as well, and we're on our third. But finding that right captain is probably the most difficult decision that I've had to make and, and been one of my biggest successes as well. Uh, chefs the ch toughest? Chefs are always tricky. Um, you know, <laughs> one of the things I first started with when I bought the vessels, you know, having an HR background, my wife have running HR for my prior company saying, listen, captain, we'll handle all the hiring. Um, just leave it to us. We'll do the interviews. Just worry about running the boat. And that was probably my biggest mistake I made um, because ultimately you have to have the crew respect the chain of command. And, you know, we realized after the second captain and with the third captain, we said, look, you're going to be in charge of all the staff. We're going to hire you. We're going to deal directly with you. You're my singular direct report. And then it's up to you to decide the crew as long as they fit the mold um, and work. You have to live with these people 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, they're going to basically help determine the success of your, your gratuity that you receive and the success of repeat guests. So I'm going to put that in your hands. And that was a mistake I made at first, but something soon corrected. And, uh, yeah, chefs are also very difficult to find, keep, and maintain. Uh, I maintain that chefs don't think of themselves as crew members, that they think of themselves as artists. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and there are more breakdowns in crew performance. I hope we don't have any chefs in here. It's not related to you. But it, it, more breakdowns in crew performance at the chef level because they are in their own little domain there and they don't want to do any bright work and they don't want to do this and that. And they're out there and doing their thing and they're artists and they're not part of the working crew. So it causes dynamics, crew dynamics that are, that are issues and all that. The crew is the key to your, to your charter success, however. You can have the greatest yacht in the world. It, it could be the most fantastic, all the war toys, all the amenities, the perfect layout, uh, everything's perfect. If that crew doesn't want to charter, the brokers will learn of that immediately and you'll never get charters. 
So you're gonna average. You're you're averaging 25 a year. Or you just had this big giant peak year. On it? No, we were averaging 25 a year. Even during COVID, yeah. um, we found ways to utilize the vessel. Yeah. We found these small trips that people wanted to do up and down the intercoastal. Um, so we were able to succeed. But yeah, we've we've maintained an average of 20 a year right now. Amazing. The Bob Weiss approach to chartering. Yeah. So uh, what? Let's, let's get back to the brokerage relationships. I know they want to hear about that. You know, what the successful. You know, what what uh, advice can you give these brokers out here that are bird dogging uh, clients, and they finally uh, you get a dialogue going with the client. One thing that you mentioned that I think is very important is to develop other relationships beyond the business relationship. You mentioned earlier that uh, you're friends now with Mike and his wife and your wife and all that, and you vacation together on occasion and all that. So uh, 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 developing these additional lifelines with yacht owners, like getting involved in their charity or playing golf with them, who knows what it is, beyond the business uh, associate, uh, situation. Would you reflect on that? So I would say the biggest thing I can say is be genuine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, typical yacht owners have been successful in the past. Um, they're making a very large purchase, whether it's a 50-foot boat or a 150-foot vessel. Um, so they've been successful. They've been through it all. They've been in the sales space. Um, they've had success. And they're looking for genuine people. And, um, you know, when I purchased my 52-foot boat, it was a typical salesperson. Um, I don't keep in touch with that person anymore. I had no issues. But it was a one and done. Um, and that, yes, while he sold me a vessel, made a couple dollars, I haven't referred him anything since. So the way I always look at it is when you're in sales, and this is any type of sales, you know, you want to look at that potential sale, not just as, all right, I sold Lee a 116-foot vessel, but how can I harness that relationship to have him bring me into another 116 deals? And that's really what I think Mike was very swift at doing and very smart about doing. And he was genuine. Um, he wasn't putting on a show. He wasn't becoming my friend just to get the sale. Ultimately, he wanted the sale. Um, he got the sale. And there's been many, many sales since then that he's gotten just from the referral. So being genuine is probably the number one, genuine and honest is the number one piece of advice that I would give a yacht broker. And talk you out of buying the wrong yacht. <laughs> talk you out of buying the wrong yacht, for sure. What, um, is, is there anything you would have done differently? So anything I would have done differently with the purchase, definitely not. I'm, I'm very happy with what we did, um, how we did it. I think we bought a, a vessel that was the right vessel for us, the right size, the right time. Um, the right efficiency. Um, if I could have predicted that COVID would have happened, that would have delayed things, obviously, yeah. um, because it's definitely a rough year, even though we did get by uh, successfully. But nothing different on the purchase. Different on the process, you know, of running the vessel, 100%. Um, like I said initially, you know, trying to be everything for the vessel, like the HR department, probably wasn't the best move. Um, but everything else has, has been quite a success for us. Um, been very happy with it. Um, and again, the key is doing everything by the book, keeping organized, just listening to the last presentation about insurance and legal matters, super important, you know, not to cut corners, to do everything organized, and to find the broker who's going to share with you exactly what the truth is. I, I remember meeting with Mike, and, you know, we met with a few different people at different boats, and one of the brokers on another boat that we were thinking to purchase was telling me how that boat's going to make me money within six months. Yeah. He gave me a printed-out list of financials that looked great. And Mike said, Lee, it's bullshit. That doesn't exist. He goes, that's not the way it's going to be. He goes, if I want to sell you the boat, I tell you to believe I think that. I, I think I developed an operating budget for you. The way, way back, a general indication of what this is going to cost you and all yep. that. I think I did project 10 weeks of charter to it. Yeah, like yep. Um, is it possible for you to maintain a work-life balance? Because so, you're the yacht manager. You're the, you, you hands-on. I've never been in a situation where I've heard where the crew get two months off. It, like when we first had this uh, seminar scheduled a month ago before the big storm and all that, uh, Lee said to me, I'm not sure I could be there, but the excuse was I'm interviewing vendors for my refit. In other words, he had the vendors lined up outside his office door, and he's interviewing them as to what their capabilities are, how much they think this is going to cost, and all that. So uh, that work-life balance thing, you know, because you're, you're managing, you're also still working, you're actively working, are you not, in, in other businesses? You know? So, I mean, first, today was actually supposed to be our C trial, and 
like most typical owners, quote unquote. I was running the sea trial too today, but uh, <laughs> that got pushed up to uh, early next week. But you know, it's it's definitely difficult in any business to have a good work life balance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in my prior business, prior to selling it, you know, this was a 24/7 operation. I was extremely hands on, and when I sold that business. Um, at 42 years old, I can't retire, so my wife wouldn't be too happy with me. To, she wants to put me back out there working. So this was my new business to have, the yachting business. And, you know, it's a, it's a full-time job for me right now. I really enjoy it. Um, I do some other consulting. I have a couple of other investments into a few other opportunities, but I'm extremely hands-on with this. Um, it's frustrating at times, just like any business can be frustrating. Um, you know, there's problems that come up unexpected. Um, they always say boat stands for break out another thousand. When you're dealing with the charter yachts, break out another 10,000. There's things breaking every day. There's issues that are always happening. But it's having a good team behind you from the crew to people like Bob and even to this day, Mike. I can't tell you how many times I call Mike um, post-sale to say, hey, having an issue with the generator, do you know anyone? And I've used so many of his vendors that he's had great experiences with, and I've stayed away from so many of the vendors that he's had bad experiences with. So I think keeping that relationship solid with your customer after the sale um, is huge um, because that's going to lead to future sales. Yeah. Well, you also, you, to the nth degree, you did your homework. And a lot of uh, b buyers coming into this marketplace don't do their homework. They get overwhelmed with the emotion. They walk up, they touch, they run their hand along the paint. This is beautiful. It's sexy. We're getting it. Forget everything else we're getting. It. And the broker and their zest and their zeal to put the deal together will sell them a bad boat on times and all. And so they're not in the favor of their customer. So I'm going to leave it at that. That is the peek into the mind. But I want to know if there's any questions, Andy, out here. We have a yacht owner sitting up here. And uh, he's obviously been through the rigors, and he's a happy, successful yacht owner. Any questions that we can ask of him? Or did I, did, did I get it all done? That's it? Nobody? Anybody? There we go. Right here. Wait for the mic, please. So, Lee, listening to your presentation, there, you've mentioned 24 charters a year. What is your burnout on the crew? You know, retention of the crew, a lot of them at 12 cry and complain about the charter product process. And then the other one that you mentioned was COVID was a situation which was concerning to you. From my point of view and looking at one of the vessels that I sold, uh, the Post-COVID was very beneficial to us in the charter situation, but when it came to 2024, what is your charter revenue now? So all three questions are great questions. Um, first with the crew, crew is, like I said, the most difficult component and the most important component. So what I did when we brought on our crew and we found solid crew is we created what we call a virtual rotational program. Um, unlike a traditional rotational program, um, we basically built relationships with the crew and said, look, this is a very busy program. You're going to make more money in a four-month window than you typically would make on a one-year window on a charter vessel. Um, we'd love for you to stay on as long as you can, but we don't want to wait till you're burnt out to then have to find crew. Would you be interested, Chief Stewardess, of doing four months on, four months on a slower program, and then guaranteeing us that you'll come back in four months? And we've designed our crew agreements, our seafare agreements, to support that um, with the right crew. And I'm not saying every crew member is like that. Um, you know, same thing with our captain. We've built a, um, a program with the captain where we have two or three fill-in captains that fill in for him multiple times a year, um, which is very important. We also have a very lenient policy um, with the captain taking time off when we're not on charter and whatnot, um, seeing his family, inviting his family on the vessel with him. Um, so the crew dynamic is super important and trying to find that balance with them because you are correct. Four, five, six, seven charters in a row, the money seems good until they get burnt out and walk off the boat. And we had that for the first year. And now with our semi-rotational program, our virtual rotation, uh, we've been able to maintain four solid chefs, four solid chief stews, four solid second stews. We, we love to promote within, bringing our second stew to a chief stew, um, bringing our deckhand to a mate or to an engineer potentially in the future. So that's how we've handled that. Um, during COVID was, was definitely scary for sure. 
There was no question that there was, um, there was concerns. You know, I had bought the boat in September of 2019. Uh, there was a hurricane, I believe it was Dorian, as I was purchasing the vessel, and everything was on hold. We couldn't get insurance at the time. Um, and then right after that, COVID kicked in a few months later. We did two charters, and then the world shut down. We brought the boat back to Miami, had to find cheap dockage somewhere and figure out what we were going to do to promote the vessel. And we started promoting local charters. We found some unique charters, um, and it was successful for us. You know, 2024 has been a very scary year for most of the industry. And I encourage you to look at the Charter Index websites and all the different charter broker websites that you can see. And we are still incredibly killing it this year, um, which is unheard of. And when we started out the year, you know, Susan warned me. She said, this is going to be the year you're going to get very upset with me. And I said, we'll figure out different ways. We'll be creative. We'll contact our, you know, repeat brokers that we've worked with. Mm -hmm. um, we built a broker incentive program to really incentivize the brokers to push the yacht for different charters. We've given all sorts of great deals for the charters. And, but we really relied on our repeat guests to get us through. Where most charter boats that we're getting five, ten charters a year, we're down to one or two. We've maintained, and uh, when we had 25 last year, we on the books for 20 for 2024, which is incredible. Repeat business, key to, su key to success in the charter business. We have a question over here. And so you said that you vetted all the professionals and interviewed them yourself. I'm just wondering, do you have a, a process that you go through or kind of you know, judge of character, see the pants, or what does that look like? When you're talking about the crew or you're talking about vendors? So as far as vendors go, um, again, being in business, uh, you know, and having a, a business with hundreds, if not thousands of vendors, you know, obviously as the CEO of the company, I, I, I dealt on a day-to-day -day basis with negotiation. So negotiating with vendors was always my strength. Um, I'm very hands-on. Like I said, I have a captain's license. I'm extremely technical. I know every system in the boat. Um, one of my titles is the CTO of Tail Lights because my crew calls me seven days a week when the router's down, when Starlink goes down, when they can't restart the uh, navigation machine. I'm the remote IT support as well. So I'm extremely hands-on, not your typical owner. So vetting the vendors is something I do directly. Um, you know, I have meetings with all the shipyards. I don't just automatically say I'm using LMC, I'm using Broward, I'm using this one. We'll meet with them, negotiate, we'll put out RFPs um, for the vendors. Um, from the crew standpoint, that's where I haven't had success in vetting it. Um, my key was finding the right captain, and once we found the captain, letting him vet the proper crew. That wasn't what we did the first year. The first year, me and my wife were interviewing everyone. Um, and we had no idea how to put the crew dynamic together, and we failed miserably. Um, but after that, we learned a couple, couple battle, scar, battle wounds and whatnot. Um, now we let the captain kind of handle that and really focus on the captain being our core for the vessel. Unique. Any, any other questions? Here, good. Over here. How much time have I got, Jeff? Jeff. Yes. Was it? Uh, yeah. Yep. What yacht are you now currently owning? An Azimut. <laughs> so I'll tell you a funny story related to that. So again, I had heard, you know, horror stories about Italian vessels and challenges and, you know, getting parts and material and whatnot. So I told Mike, stay away. And Mike respected that. We saw every brand other than Azimut. And we just didn't find anything that fit the bill. And I remember I was with my father at the time. We, he, Mike was about to drop us off at Fort Lauderdale Airport. And he says, there's one more vessel I want to show you. And we've seen about 18 of them already. Um, there's one more vessel I want to show you. It's in the shipyard right now. Um, it's having some paint work done. It's out of the water. Um, it's ripped apart. The ceilings are open. There's floors ripped apart. There's sanding going on. And it's an azimuth. I said, well, I don't like the fact that it's an azimuth, but I would love to see the inner workings of this vessel, what's going on behind closed doors. I said, let's go take a look at it. And as soon as we went there, I fell in love with it. Um, I started doing a little bit more research, spoke to a bunch of people like Bob and others. And some of the concerns that I had with the brand were mainly focused around the smaller vessels of the azimuth style versus the larger. I actually took a trip out to the shipyard in Via Reggio in, uh, in Italy, actually saw the process, uh, went to the Benetti factory as well. And I got a lot more comfortable with my purchase at that point and been very happy ever since. I think we're out of time. Unique, a business plan, developed other lines of communication and connections with his broker who was particularly effective. 
knew how to, what to say to him, knew how to steer him the right way, and uh, a success in the yacht, and a happy yacht owner. Thank you for sharing all of that with us, Lee. Thank you, Bob, and pleasure to meet everyone. Thank you so much.